Welcome to or welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am so excited that you guys are here, especially for today's video, and I hope that you guys are having an absolutely fantastic morning, afternoon, or night, whatever it is for you when this video finally reaches you. You guys, I am so excited for today's video and what we are about to dive into. If you guys have been on my channel for a while now, you guys would know that one of my absolute favorite series here on my channel is when I talk about horror films that are based on or inspired by real life events and then dig through the real life story, the real life people and what truly happened. I initially started out this series with The Conjuring 1, Conjuring 2. We dove into the true story behind Annabelle, the true story behind The Nun, or the inspiration behind The Nun, which led to us talking about a ton of Ed and Lorraine Warren cases, items in the Warren's Occult Museum, and the lives of Ed and Lorraine Warren as a whole. Ed and Lorraine Warren's cases have fascinated me for as long as I can remember, and back in 2018, I covered the case of Arnie Johnson here on my channel, which is better known as the Devil Made Me Do It case. Now, this was the very first case in American history, or murder case, sorry, in American history, where the defense was demonic possession, which is just fascinating in and of itself that that was the in-court defense. Now back when I filmed that particular video, I was under the impression that The Conjuring 3 would be based on the Ed and Lorraine Warren case of the South End Werewolf. I had no idea that they were going to take it in the direction of Arnie Johnson and the Devil Made Me Do It case, but when it was announced, I can't even explain to you guys how excited I was for this film to release, which by the way, The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It is out now in theaters and to rent at home. I recently watched it and after watching it, so many of you guys were requesting that I cover it and even though I have covered covered it in the past. I wanted to turn on this camera and dissect the movie and the case with you guys and revisit it once again with the movie being out now because I just have so many thoughts and even I myself wanted to go back into who is Arnie Johnson? Is he innocent? Is he how he was depicted in the film? What's the truth behind him and his experience? What was Ed and Lorraine Warren's involvement? And overall, did the devil really make him do it? So today, we're going to be revisiting The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, a Ed and Lorraine Warren case that made American history by being the first ever murder defense as demonic possession. So without further ado, sit back, relax, maybe turn a light on because we're about to get into The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, real life versus the movie. Let's get into it. Conjuring the Devil Made Me Do It is the seventh film in the Conjuring universe, but it is The Conjuring 3. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but The Conjuring is the largest horror franchise in history. The current released films include the first two Conjuring films, as well as Annabelle, Annabelle Creation, The Nun, Annabelle Comes Home, and now The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. The Conjuring universe gives us a glimpse into the real life cases of none other than Ed and Lorraine Warren. And if you guys have been on my channel for a while, you guys would know that I have been absolutely fascinated by the lives of Ed and Lorraine Warren and the cases that they investigated. So before we get into this particular investigation of theirs, I wanna start out with just a brief recap on Ed and Lorraine Warren themselves. This is Ed Warren, here with Lorraine. All right, let's get started. So as I mentioned, I have been a huge fan of Ed and Lorraine Warren. I've covered pretty much every single case. I covered the lives of Ed and Lorraine Warren, so I'm not gonna go too far into detail as far as who they are, how they met, how they came to be, and all of that. I will link my video down below on the lives of Ed and Lorraine Warren if you're interested in that, but I, I will spare you guys the details for this video because it is something that I've covered in the past. But the reason I kind of wanted to start with Ed and Lorraine Warren is because I know that there is skepticism revolving around them at times. I know that people are pretty split when it comes to the Warrens and the investigations that the Warrens embarked on. There are people who 100% believe in all the experiences that were had and everything that they documented and then there's people who believe it was hoax and it was fabricated but if you guys have been on my channel for a while 
You guys would know that I've worked with Warner Brothers in the past on films in the Conjuring universe. And one of the opportunities that Warner Brothers presented me was the once in a lifetime opportunity to be flown to the Warren's Occult Museum, meet Tony Sparrow, which is Ed and Lorraine Warren's son-in-law, meet Judy Warren, which is their daughter, and hear the experiences firsthand. You know, I got to hear Judy talk about the lives of her parents and the legacy that they've left on. I got to hear Tony talk about the investigations and the stories like Ed had told him. And it felt so real to me. Like I've always believed in the Warrens and I've, I've been huge fans of theirs. I actually was hoping to get to meet Lorraine Warren before she passed, but it was just a completely different experience having been there, being in the museum, walking through it, meeting Annabelle, and actually being told ahead of time, look, like us influencers being told, look, this is very real to this family. So whether you believe it or not, please uphold the utmost respect. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that because I've had that firsthand experience of talking with Judy Warren and hearing, you know, the stories through people who were closest to them. And it just makes these cases all the more fascinating to me because I know that they truly believe in the experiences Ed and Lorraine Warren did have. So with that being said, let's get into first and foremost, the plot of the Conjuring movie kind of what the movie's about. I'm not gonna give any spoilers on the movie. I'll give the generalized plot because if you guys have yet to see it, I don't wanna be the one to spoil the ending for you. But I do wanna talk a little bit about the film itself and then get into and revisit the real life case of Arnie Johnson. It's a witch's totem. We think your family was cursed. So The Conjuring 3 is a movie based on, as I mentioned earlier, the real life possession case of Arnie Johnson. It reveals a chilling story of terror, murder, and unknown evil that shocked even experienced real life investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. So the movie begins in 1981, where Ed and Lorraine Warren are investigating the possession of a young boy named David Glatzel. In the presence of this exorcism is Father Gordon and David's sister, Debbie Glatzel, and her fiance, Arnie Johnson. Now, Arnie loves David so much and is so traumatized by what David is being put through that at one point during the exorcism, he, in essence, challenges the demon to come into him and leave the boy alone, to which it does. Now, ultimately, this would lead to Arnie suffering from similar experiences that David was and eventually stabbing his landlord, Bruno Sauls, over 20 times, resulting in his death. Now, afterwards, Arnie is very confused and, and feels as though the devil made him do it. Now, the Warrens believe him. They believe he was possessed during the time of the murders. So with the support of the Warrens, his case becomes the first in US history where the defense is demonic possession. The movie has a bunch of twists and turns and it truly is thrilling, but as I mentioned, I'm not gonna give away the ending of the movie itself. But I was shocked by the amount of things, or the amount of details, sorry, that were put into the film that were truly inspired by the real life event. So before we get into what exactly happened, let's talk about Arnie Johnson, because I feel like it's very important to paint a picture of his personality type prior to everything transpiring. What happened that day? That was not Arnie. I think I hurt someone. So before we get into what actually happened in the film, I want to start out by talking about the real life Arnie Johnson, what he was like and what his personality was like prior to everything that would transpire in this unfortunate tale of events. So Arnie Johnson was engaged to Debbie Glatzel and he was described as a very, very kind person. He was very close with Debbie's family and more specifically Debbie's younger brother, David. Arnie was described as a kind person, someone that you would want to have around. Ed and Lorraine Warren even went as far as to say, if you had a son, he is the type of son that you would want to have. And he was just well-liked and well-respected. So at this point in his life, he and Debbie had just recently gotten a rental property that needed to be cleaned up and just made livable before they could actually move into it. And something that they noticed very quickly was that when David, Debbie, and Arnie went to the property to clean it out, they noticed that the previous tenants had left like a mattress 
in the room. Or sorry, they had left a bed behind in the room and the bed had a very strange stain on it. Now I do want to note that it's actually believed the stain is where the possession stems from, which is where in the movie the water bed is the representation of that bed that they discovered in the room. Now after Diva came into contact with this space and more specifically that strange stain on the bed, he started acting very out of character and actually wanted nothing to do with the space itself. Now initially they thought maybe he just wanted to get out of cleaning or he didn't want to be there but soon they noticed that very quickly after being within that space his whole personality started changing it's important to note that with David, David was a very happy-go-lucky, kind, outgoing kid. He got along with everybody. He was a very bold, bright personality. And after this experience, he started becoming more and more withdrawn. He was now quiet. He was skittish and scared. And he started having these really intense, extreme nightmares. And this would turn out to be very hard on Arnie, who, as I mentioned, really liked David. He had a real honest love for David. So with all of that being said, now let's get into and revisit the true story and the events that transpired prior to the murder itself. The court accepts the existence of God every time a witness swears to tell the truth. I think it's about time they accept the existence of the devil. So in 1980 in Brookfield, Connecticut, there was a family that consisted of the mother, Judy Glatzel, the father, Carl Glatzel, the daughter, Debbie Glatzel, and the youngest son, David Glatzel. At this time, David was 11 years old, and as I mentioned, he was a very happy-go-lucky good kid. He had an outgoing personality, and he really had a lot going for him. Now, as I mentioned, shortly after being within that rental property, David started acting very strange. As I mentioned, he was becoming withdrawn. He was becoming scared of pretty much everything and that's when the night terrors started. All of this happened very quickly after being in contact with that bed with a strange marking on it. He would wake up from these nightmares claiming to have seen a man with a very skinny face, completely blacked out eyes, like jagged teeth, and animal features like pointed ears and hooves. David would describe this man as the beast man. Now David's mother questioned him about the beast man. She was obviously concerned as this was totally out of his character and when she questioned him more and more about the beast man he told her that the beast man said he was going to take his soul. Now at this point Debbie asked Arnie to step in and really guide David and hopefully bring the fear out of him and just help him but no matter what anybody tried to do Arnie included things just continued to get worse and even started to turn violent. David would wake up with cuts and bruises all over his arms. His now nightmares were no longer nightmares anymore. He was seeing the beast man in the flesh. In real life, he was claiming to see him. And on top of that, he began to hiss, speak in multiple voices, and even growl at people. It was getting out of control. So the family turned to the church and the priest came in to bless the space, but like with most demonic entities, blessings are not always enough and in fact, more often than not, just aggravate the entity and that's exactly what happened. Things got much worse after the priest came in to bless the space. So the priest wound up reaching out to Ed and Lorraine Warren to come and meet the family and figure out what they could do to save David. It got to a point, you guys, where David was so bad, somebody had to monitor him while sleeping because he would wake up like every 30 minutes screaming in a complete trance and he was even having seizures. So his health was now in jeopardy. So when Ed and Lorraine Warren came in to meet David and the family, while Ed was talking to David, Lorraine saw like a black mist manifesting next to him and she said that that was one of the moments that she realized oh my gosh this is dark this is a very very dark entity David would also say that these invisible hands were choking him and he would actually have the markings to show for it and he started to feel like he was being slapped and beaten by invisible forces as well now David had this dinosaur toy that was just a toy it was just plastic there was no um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for like it didn't move around or talk or anything of that nature and at one point in the presence of the Warrens the toy moved across the floor and a voice came out from around it saying that they were all going to die now I got to meet this toy when I was in the Warren's Cult Museum and Tony shared a little bit of a backstory on it. So I'll insert that clip here for you guys now so you guys can hear what Tony had to say about said toy that I did get to meet, which is kind of cool. The creature was in a famous case that Ed and Lorraine investigated back in 1980 called the Devil in Connecticut case or the Devil Made Me Do It case. And what that case was, was a young boy by the name of David Glatzel from Brookfield, Connecticut was possessed by a diabolical entity. And this thing that he, he made himself, 
he glued it all together. And as it, as he put it down on the floor one day, and the Warrens saw this, Ed and Lorraine both, it glided across the carpet, and a voice came from around it and said, you are all going to die. A very famous case. You could read it, you could probably get, find the book on eBay called The Devil in Connecticut by Gerald Brittle. But it's as told to the Warrens, as the Warrens told it to Gerald Brittle. The entire story of, of Arnie Johnson and David Glatzel. And what happened ultimately and ended in a murder of a young man by Arnie Johnson. And the claim was that the devil made him do it. The devil went into him and made him do it. Very famous case. Now at this point, the Warrens discovered very quickly that he wasn't just under demonic attack. He was full on possessed. And so the Warrens, along with four priests, set out to exorcise him of 43 demons. Now, as I mentioned, this was very hard for Arnie to witness. He loved David and it was breaking his heart seeing David like this. Now, at one point during an exorcism, Arnie, in essence, taunted a demon saying, I bet you wouldn't come inside of me, come inside of me instead of him, leave him alone. And that was exactly what the demon did. Now, not right that moment, he wasn't all of a sudden possessed, but the demon had transferred, or I guess 43 demons had transferred into Arnie and were now leaving David alone. Now, you never want to taunt the unknown, ever. Demons require permission for entry, and so to ever offer up your soul to a demon is just a recipe for disaster. Unfortunately, it would end in, in just that. So in the film, the landlord's name is Bruno Sauls, but in real life, his name was Alan Bono. And not only was he their landlord, but he also hired Debbie as a dog groomer in the kennel that he owned as well. Now around this time, Debbie started noticing that Arnie was acting very strange. He would go in and out of trances and while in the trance, he would growl and hiss and act out of character. And then when he would come to, he would have no recollection of what he'd just done. She actually started to get pretty worried because his actions were in alignment with what David had been acting like. And so she started to worry that this was now a problem with him as well. On February 16th of 1981, things would take an absolutely horrific turn when Arnie decided to call in sick to work and go and hang out with Debbie. Now, Debbie was also with her nine-year-old cousin, Mary, and David's sister, Wanda, at their job at the kennel. So he went to go hang out with the three of them. Alan Bono would show up and decide to take the group out to lunch. And during the lunch, he became rather intoxicated. He was drinking quite a bit. And when they returned back to the kennel, things just felt very off. An altercation broke out between Arnie and Alan, and at one point, Alan grabbed the nine-year-old little girl and refused to let go. So Arnie grabbed a five-inch pocket knife out of his pocket and began to repeatedly stab Alan, which would result in his death. Now after this, Arnie fled the scene. Arnie was discovered three kilometers from where the murder had taken place and was completely out of it. He didn't realize what he'd done. He was so confused and he was held on a bond of $125,000. Now he had no idea what had happened. Like in essence, the way that he described it was he all of a sudden came to and he was covered in somebody else's blood and had no idea what had happened. So the next day, Lorraine immediately went to the police and told them that he was under demonic possession. Now, as I mentioned, this had never been done in the history of the United States. Nobody had, you know, went in with their defense on a murder trial claiming that it was the devil, that the devil made them do it. But the Warrens were, were certain that that is what happened and they pushed forward for that defense. They planned to fly out exorcist specialists from Europe and they even threatened to subpoena priests who wouldn't come forward and talk about what truly happened during the exorcisms of David Glatzel. They wanted these priests to come forward and say, look, he was possessed. Arnie did challenge it and it did go inside of Arnie. The trial took place in Connecticut Superior Court in Danbury on October 28th, 1981, but unfortunately their defense of demonic possession did not hold up in court. So at this point they had to to change their story in order to try to get him a lessened charge and they decided to take the narrative of self-defense because he had grabbed the little girl so they said Arnie felt very threatened he was scared for the little girl he was scared for himself and that that was why he had done what he did now the jury did find Arnie Johnson guilty of first-degree manslaughter giving him 10 to 20 years in prison of which he would only serve five years of that sentence and he would marry um, Debbie Glatzel now forever afterwards Arnie 
Johnny swears up and down that the devil did make him do it, that he was possessed, and Debbie believes that as well, along with the Warrens. In their lifetime, they believed this as well. But there were plenty of people who had absolutely no idea what to believe. Now, when it came to the film, I felt as though it was very well done. I think it was a great representation of the case. I liked how they tied in the bed. I liked how they, you know, stuck true to the kennel and why he had done what he did and the fact that he truly was possessed. Now, were there minor details changed? Absolutely. But overall, I think that the film was great. I mean, The Conjuring Universe has yet to let me down. I think The Conjuring Universe is some of my favorite films of all time. I absolutely love it and I love it even more because it is inspired by real life events. But that leads into my question. Is it truly a case of the devil making him do it? Or was he a killer? or somebody who lost control of themselves for a minute there. So was Arnie Johnson truly possessed or did he snap? Well, here's where things took a very interesting turn. In 1983, Gerald Brittle, with the assistance of Lorraine Warren, published a book. Now the book was on the incident and was titled The Devil in Connecticut. It was said that some of the profits from the book were gonna go towards the family and also getting Arnie out of prison. However, after the book's republication in 2006 by iUniverse, the Glatzels wound up suing the authors and publishers of the novel for violating their right to privacy. They claimed that everything was a hoax made up by Ed and Lorraine Warren in order to exploit David's mental illness. They claimed that the Warrens told them that this story would make them millions and therefore get Arnie out of prison. However, Arnie and Debbie claim that it was entirely the truth and they stand by the Warrens. They claim that the Glassels were suing solely for monetary purposes. So nobody truly knows. Overall, I did just want to include that because I really want to know your guys' thoughts and theories, not only on the movie itself and the story's depiction in the movie, but also whether or not you guys think the devil truly did make him do it. So take all of that into account and make sure you guys let me know in the comment section down below what it is you guys think happened. As for me, I stand in the same space that I was in back in 2018. I don't truly know what happened, but it's a fascinating case nonetheless, and I am so glad that it's part of the Conjuring series now. Overall, I do highly recommend that you guys watch the new Conjuring film, The Devil Made Me Do It. I'll have a link to the trailer down below. You guys can check it out. As I mentioned, it is available in theaters and to rent at home. I rented it at home, it was so cozy, it was awesome. Um, and I just really enjoyed it. So I thought that we would revisit this case. What's happening to my boys? So I thought that we would revisit this case um, and I hope that you guys enjoyed this video nonetheless, despite the fact that I did cover it back in 2018. But I would love to know all of your guys' thoughts, opinions, and theories. And that is it for today's video. If there are any other real life cases or horror films with a true story behind that you guys want me to dive into, definitely let me know down in the comment section below. I'm looking for some more cases to cover, so I would love any suggestions from you guys. If you guys are new to my channel or you are just not yet subscribed, but you do enjoy my content, I would seriously love it more than you will ever know if you go ahead and click that subscribe button. And please give this video a big thumbs up if you did enjoy it. Remember, I love to do all things with kindness. And until next time, I love you.